And let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel according to Mark. When I was a child, I remember thinking how delightful it must be to get a letter addressed to you in the mail. (laughs) It seemed like my dad got countless amounts of letters (laughs) addressed to him in the mail. I, I almost never got letters, except for on your birthday you would maybe get some, but the rest of the year it was... Nothing. I remember thinking, boy, wouldn't that be great to get a letter addressed to you in the mail? And there is something delightful about knowing that another person is writing specifically to you, is, is giving themselves, as it were, to you in their writing. And of course, the more important and valuable the person is that writes to you, the more precious that letter becomes. So let's consider for a moment that you have here a letter written to you from God. Let's remember that truth. We all know it as a fact, but it is important to ponder it and to cherish it before we read, to consider that God himself has written to you. God, the God, the God who is, who is there, as the theologians say, he has written to you. And not only is the person who is writing important, the person he is writing about is important in Mark, especially as we begin this marvelous series this morning. The great pastor J.C. Ryle helps us to appreciate the value of the journey we're about to go on when he wrote in a sermon on Mark the following. I wish, he said, professing Christians in this day studied the four Gospels more than they do. They were written to make us acquainted with Christ. Four different inspired hands have drawn the picture of the Savior, His ways, His manners, His feelings, His wisdom, His grace, His patience, His love. His power are graciously unfolded to us by four different witnesses. Ought not the sheep to be familiar with the shepherd? Ought not the patient to be familiar with the physician? Ought not the bride to be familiar with the bridegroom? Ought not the sinner to be familiar with the Savior? Surely... We cannot know this Christ too well. Surely there is not a word, nor a deed, nor a day, nor a step, nor a thought in the record of his life which ought not to be precious to us. We should labor to be familiar with every line that is written about Jesus. Come now. And let us study together a page in our master's history. Are our hearts distracted by sorrows and weighed down by sins? Are we contented with the plastic treasures and glowing screens of this world? Has it been too long since we saw more of the one we were made to know? Have we plateaued in our knowledge and love of Christ? Have we hesitated in calling others to him? Well, we have here the solution. We have here pages on the person most important for us to know. The person that we cannot know too well. We have here a letter with an ocean view of Christ, crested with waves which should overwhelm our senses. We have a a gold mine which stretches before us with every mine shaft streaked with gold and treasure. Surely, surely we cannot look too far or dig too deep or know him too well. So may the journey 
begin. Let us know Christ in this book. Let us know him well. Let us know him better. Let's begin reading Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair, and wore a leather belt around his waist, and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. There is much in this opening eight verses that we can use to know Christ better. That is Mark's intention. He breaks up these opening eight verses into what we might call a title and an introduction. So those will be my two points this morning. They're not even in the text because the title has a a disproportionate importance uh, to its length. So Mark's title and John's introduction will be the organizing points uh, this morning. Let's dive in. Let's know Christ well, uh, benefiting from this writer, Mark. The first point is this, Mark's title. Mark's title. Now, (laughs) I'm using that a bit as a play on words because the title we think of when we think about this book is the name Mark. So who is this Mark, and why do we call this book Mark? Well, Mark was most likely, he was most likely the young man associated with Paul and Barnabas on their initial church planting journey that we read about in Acts 12 and 13. And he must have continued in ministry for some time because we read at the end of Paul's life the following in 2 Timothy 4, 11. Get Mark, Paul writes, and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. But it's actually Mark's association with Peter that is particularly in view. He must have served multiple different apostles because we read in 1 Peter 5.13, she who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Most church historians, theologians believe this is the Mark that we are referring to when we talk about Mark's gospel. He was probably, probably an associate, a close associate of both Paul and Barnabas and Peter. And likely, Peter is a primary influence on this gospel. Some people consider the gospel of Mark to actually be Peter's firsthand account told through the writing of Mark. Now, not exclusively. Mark probably had his own views and opinions having traveled with Paul. But this is largely probably Peter's gospel as well, which is exciting to think about. The apostle Peter giving us his own perspective on the ministry and the deeds of the Lord Jesus. So this is Mark, but that's not actually Mark's title. Mark didn't title this after himself. That's a tradition from church history. The title that Mark gives is the first line of his gospel. Look down there. This is Mark's title sentence, we might say. If Mark had a title, I believe this is what it would be. The beginning of, and here's the title, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So if Mark was going to hand you a book and he was going to scribble on the front of his title, I think he would say, The Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's Mark's title. 
And as all titles should do, Mark's title indicates the primary focus and central theme of this book. This is a book about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And Mark uses those words intentionally. It's a book about Jesus, the human man Jesus from Nazareth, the man who walked dusty roads, ate food, and walked and talked with sinners. That Jesus who is also, Mark says, the Christ, the promised Messiah, the anointed one who would be God's chosen king over all the earth. And for Mark, the climactic title, he is not only a Messiah, not only an impressive human teacher, he is the Son of God. And that title indicates for Mark both his divinity, which he'll be talking more about in a few verses, and his intentional servanthood of his father. For Mark, the concept of Jesus being the son of God sets him in contrast with Israel, who was something of a a prodigal son, to benefit from Aaron's excellent message last week. Israel had been something of a prodigal son to the Lord who had rescued him from Egypt. He had wandered away and been punished in exile. But this is God's faithful son, God's divine son, the son who will seek after the prodigal, who will faithfully fulfill his father's purposes. Jesus as God's son indicates both his divinity and his obedience. And actually, we know that because this phrase, the Son of God, is used again in 15 chapters when a Roman centurion witnessing the earthquake surrounding the death of this very Lord Jesus Christ declares in a moment of insight, surely this man is the Son of God. So Mark wraps his gospel with this title, the Son of God, the true Son. The son who is divine and yet is a faithful and obedient servant to his father. The son determined to do the father's will, to fight his father's enemies, and to rescue his father's people. The son who will go out after his prodigal people and will bring them home. This is that son, the son worthy of all attention. And as Pastor Ryle tells us, we can't know him too well. You can't know Jesus too well. Listen, I don't know how long you've been a Christian, many of you for many decades. You don't know the half of Jesus Christ. You don't know the half, and I don't either. Some of you may know him better than me. You've been following him longer than me. But you, you can't know the half of how glorious, how great he is. He is the son of God, which indicates his divinity and the profound nature of his mission. You can't know him too well. Listen, heaven itself and eternity will not exhaust our study of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark titles his book this way because there is no more exalted title he could give it. This is the best and most important title for his life's work. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And impressively, it is good news. There's that wonderful word, euangelion, that Greek word that means gospel. Good news. Good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's Mark's title. What we have to ask is, is that an effective title for our lives? Because that's what Mark wants. Mark has no interest. This guy's been in ministry for years, probably decades at this point. He has no interest in transferring mere information. He wants transformation. He wants affection. He wants adoration. He wants faith. He wants you and me. He wants our hearts. He wants us to know and love this Son of God. So let's pause for a moment before we move on from the title and ask the question, do you know Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Do you know him? How well do you know him? One of my favorite books, the author talks about a conversation he had with a friend that was going through a a time of trial, being persecuted by people who claimed to be Christians but were 
acting very sinfully towards him in this scenario. And this man, as he's recounting the situation, spoke very matter-of-factly, saying, it, it doesn't matter, because I've known God, and, and they have not. Didn't seem he was speaking itself righteously. He was just matter-of-factly declaring that for him, the knowing of God mattered more than, than anything else. And the knowing of Jesus Christ is the way in which we know God. So let's, let's ask the question. If you've been a Christian even decades, let me urge you, don't answer quickly. Of course I do. I, of course I know that. Do you know him? Right now, do you know him? Do you know him as your Savior, as your Messiah? Do you know him as the Son of God? exalted and humble. Do you know him? As pastors, this is the primary reason we want to preach through this book, so that we would know him. If you're 70 or you're 7, do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Do you know him in his value, not just facts about him or religious thinking about him? Do you know him? Would you say this week that you have known God? Would you say this Thursday evening in the middle of your week that you are knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, that you are knowing him in the midst of your temptations and your struggles and your, your family needs and your parenting needs and your health needs and your, your challenging thoughts about the future? Are you knowing Jesus Christ, the Son of God? That's what Mark wants. He says, good news I have for you, good news, but it's news about a person, a person you must know. Sometimes as Christians, we can slip into the habit of thinking of the gospel primarily as facts and insurance for eternity rather than a person that we are in living relationship with. Mark will not allow us to do that. Mark, Mark's gospel is explicitly and unapologetically personal. It is about a person. Mark has no interest in talking about a, a hypothetical forgiveness of sins or some kind of grand view of eternal insurance. He, he wants to focus us on the person of the Lord Jesus. As John Calvin would have said, clothed in all of his benefits, yes, but it is the person that saves us, and that's what Mark wants us to see. He wants us to know him. So let me ask you if you're 7 or 70, 8 or 80, 25 or 45, do you know him? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Because that's what Mark wants you to know. That's what God wants you to know. That's what God writes in this letter. Do you know my son? Is the title of this gospel an effective title for our life? Is our life appropriately captioned by the joyful reception of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Be honest with yourself. Don't, 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 don't push away from any conviction that might be there. Ask yourself, this, this week, January, from now until next week, looking back to last week, here, here we are in the middle of life, is the knowing of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is, is that an appropriate caption, a centerpiece for your life? Is that priority in Mark the priority of our hearts, the priority of our Bible reading, the priority of our conversations is the knowing of Jesus Christ right now, today, in 2020, more important to you than ever. And if not, if not, there is work to be done. There is work to be done because it should be. And thankfully, Mark does not leave us just with the title. He writes a book to help us get there. Isn't that kind of him? Isn't it kind that he didn't just say at the beginning, are you focused primarily more than anything else in your passion and in your thinking on Jesus Christ, the Son of God? No? Too bad for you. I'll see you later. No, he doesn't do that. He writes 16 chapters to help us know, know this person that he says it's most important that we know. So let me urge you, you need to know him. And if that isn't a good caption for your real life, if something else would be a better caption, maybe busyness or self-improvement 
or even good things like a family unity or work. If something else would be a better caption for your life, listen, we need Mark to help us. We need God to help us. And actually, he helps us immediately because he moves from a title to an introduction that is rich with knowing of the Lord Jesus. Let's move to point two, John's introduction. John's introduction. Verse 2 says, as it is written. So the gospel he's referring to is something that he can point back historically to discuss. As it is written in Isaiah, the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. John appeared, he says. A number of years ago, there was a, a television show. (laughs) <laughs> which had a lot of twists and turns and mysteries and uncertainties over multiple seasons, and the finale was approaching, and, and there was a great anticipation of how the producers were going to somehow reveal the master plan behind all of these mysteries and these twists and these turns. It was, it was greatly anticipated how they were going to demonstrate how it all fit together. And then the finale came, and there was a great cry of outrage because there was no master plan. There was uh, no great purpose for all the plot lines. They just ended. It seemed as though the writer simply said, meaningless is the plot. And everybody was furious at them. I'm sure there was great gnashing of teeth among TV watchers around the world. It only convinced more that TV is a complete waste of time. What am I doing watching these pointless plots that lead nowhere? Not so with God. Not so with God. For God, his plot line has been planned forever and leads certainly without fail, to the coming of his son. Not so with God. God has had a plan for his son and his entrance into this world that nothing could stop or alter. Mark quotes Isaiah. He actually quotes Exodus and Micah to lead into the quote about Isaiah. These phrases, behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. That's, that's looking back at Exodus. It's looking back at Micah, talking about a messenger of the Lord. And then he comes into this quote about a, a person, an individual, who's going to come before the Lord, a servant, and have this task of, of smoothing out his way. One commentator uh, talked about it this way. If, if a great king comes into an unknown country, certainly a servant would go before him in that time of bad roads and would make sure that the bumps were going to be too severe. So he would raise up valleys. He would crush down mountains. He would make sure that the king could come in smoothly along the road to visit his people. And that's the, the idea here, except in this case it is a, a spiritual valleys that need to be raised up, spiritual hills that need to be broken down. And so John is this predicted prophet that is going to prepare the way of the Lord, that is going to straighten the path into the hearts of God's people. That's the idea. And this has been predicted for hundreds of years, that a messenger was going to come before the coming of the Messiah. So this is John's introduction. And again, a play on words, John's introduction is not really about John. It's really about who he introduces, the Lord Jesus Christ. So John appears, it says in verse 4. He's baptizing people in the wilderness, The wilderness was a very special place for the people of God. It'll play a key place in this gospel. In the wilderness, they were brought out of slavery and met with God and then were delivered into the promised land. The wilderness was also the place of great testing. It's the place where they were opposed by the enemies of God. The wilderness is this key symbolic place, and that's where John is. That's where people have to go if they're going to meet with this great messenger of the Lord. He is there in the wilderness, and he is calling people to repentance for the forgiveness of their sins. So this must be what the smoothing out of the road is about. He is he's calling people who have proud hearts to humble themselves and who have hopeless hearts to have hope again. 
He's smoothing out hearts in preparation for the coming of the Lord to his people. He's calling them to be baptized, a a symbolic act of cleansing, of, of declaring that we want our souls to be washed and to come clean before the Lord. He's doing this ministry in the Jordan. And you want to notice his clothing. This is not Mark's interest in details for no reason. Uh, John's clothing of camel's hair and a leather belt. His geographic location in Jordan would identify him with the prophet Elijah. In other words, a, a reader of this who has any familiarity with the Old Testament would say, boy, he looks a lot like Elijah. This was an ordinary garb uh, in this day. This wasn't how Jesus dressed. This wasn't how the Pharisees dressed. It wasn't how the fishermen dressed. This was a very intentional, symbolic clothing line. We might call it the Elijah line, okay? Uh, he, He wears this Elijah line clothing in order to indicate to people, hey, guess who I'm like? So what people in those days would look at him and say, hey, that looks a lot like Elijah. Yes, he does. What did Elijah do? Well, he called people to return to the Lord in repentance, and he confronted God's enemies, And he declared that they must return to the the God who had called them and chosen them. Guess what John's going to do? Exactly the same thing. So this man has this, this clothing that marks him as one chosen by God to represent him. And Elijah was said to come before the coming of the Messiah. It's declared in the Old Testament that there would be an Elijah that would come and, and, and he would prepare the hearts of the people for the coming of the Messiah. So you see what God is doing. He, he's, he's bringing all of those Old Testament threads to this moment with a single individual in the wilderness and saying, the time has come. The time has come. A great prophet has arisen again. He's calling the people to repent. He's calling the people to cleansing. He's calling the people to return. Come back to the wilderness. Come back to the place of the burning bush. Come back to the place of Mount Sinai. Come back to the place of meeting with God. But then he has a surprising message. I am not the one ultimately you need to meet. Ultimately, he says, I'm I'm just the messenger that was predicted. So great is the one to come that he has a forerunner to go before him. So great is the one to come that he must be announced prophetically that even the forerunner has been prophesied about. So great is the one to come that prophets were given a task to predict even that forerunner announcing the coming of Jesus Christ. So he says in verse 7, after me comes he who is mightier than I. He's stronger than me, he says. Actually, he's so great, I don't even deserve to untie his sandals. Now, that's that's not just a a made-up expression that John came up with, with quick. It's not like he's saying, I don't even deserve to wipe his cleats. Uh, no, John's not just coming up with ideas here in the wilderness. Uh, the, the untying of sandals was something that was below the lowest slave. P- people were released from that duty because it was considered uh, so common, so dirty. And, and John says, I- I'm not worthy to do that. I'm not worthy to do that. You might wonder whether his meditation on Isaiah, had led him to Isaiah 6, where Isaiah the great prophet says, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And, and, and John the Baptist says, Woe is me, I, I'm not worthy even to untie his sandals. The, the lowest slave has a more mighty position than I should have compared to the greatness of this one who is to come. What's Mark doing right now? What's he doing this? What's he intending to do? Just give us information. So Bible class says, what did John the Baptist wear? Camel's hair. Very good, son. Uh, What did he eat? Locusts. No, Mark doesn't care about Bible tests. He cares about showing in a story form the greatness of Jesus Christ. Because he knows we all tend to minimize him. We all tend to see less glory in Jesus than we should. You do and I do. And what John is saying 
is that John the Baptist, the mighty preacher, the second coming of Elijah, the one called by God, this, this mighty holy man who's calling the nation to repentance, he says, I'm not worthy to touch his shoes. If that's true of John, then every other person is meant to say, well, then what, what is true of me? H how much more lowly am I than this one who is to come? How great must this one coming be if John, the mighty John, actually, you know, John is referenced even by ancient historians in a way that Jesus is not. This guy was a big deal. He was a notable deal in history. And he says, I'm not worthy even to be listed in his roles of servants. I deserve to be outside the door just looking in because of how great he is. What's the point of this? To look down on John? No, no. All of us should be looking up to John who is looking up to Jesus. The point of this is to impress something. Do you have any idea? who is about to come to this riverbank? Do you have any idea how glorious he is? How worthy? How majestic? How venerable? How God he is? That's what John is saying. That's what John's introduction is about. He's calling people to repentance and baptism because this God that is coming to them, this Son of God coming to them, is not coming to people to just improve the outside of their lives. He's coming to people who will give all of themselves to Him, who will transfer all of their allegiance to Him. He's coming to people who are willing to have their whole hearts cleansed, their whole lives restored. He's coming to people who cast aside the comfort of the city and come to meet God in the wilderness. And actually, in bare disguised symbolism. These quotes make a very important point. This passage in Isaiah is very, very clearly talking about God himself. Anybody who reads Isaiah without reading Mark 1 would be thinking, as an Israelite, God is coming to his people. God is coming. God is coming to meet with us. God is coming to restore us. God is coming. Yahweh himself is coming to encounter us the way he did in the wilderness. But this passage says that that God who is coming is Jesus. Here's the mystery of the passage. The Messiah, the anointed king, is Yahweh, God. The roads paved for the glory of the Lord are the roads paved for Jesus of Nazareth. The one who controlled all things and was the one and only God prayed to for hundreds of years by Jewish children in synagogues. No, this is the one who has taken on flesh and is coming to the wilderness to meet with his repenting and restored people. This is Yahweh revealed in the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. God has Come, listen, unless we appreciate the, the nature of Jesus as God the Son, we will, we will never fully appreciate the incredible mission he goes about in this gospel to save us. Consider the glory of this surprise for an Israelite scribe. They were anticipating the Messiah, and they were anticipating one day God himself living among his people. What Mark is saying is that they are one and the same. Octavius Winslow says this. Had he, Jesus, not taken a single step in working out the salvation of man, had he repaired no breach, wept no tear, endured no agony, shed no blood in the redemption of his church, had he, in a word, not conferred a solitary blessing upon our race, he still had been the eternal Son of God, divine 
peerless, glorious, the object of supreme love, adoration, and worship by all celestial beings and through all ages. In other words, if he had never come, he would be worthy of infinite and exalted angelic worship forever. So here's the incredible surprise there. He did all of those things. Being God, being worthy of being called Yahweh himself, God himself comes to his people in the form of the servant Jesus Christ. God himself comes to the wilderness. God himself, that's why John the Baptist is saying, I'm not worthy to touch him. I'm not worthy to be counted the lowest of his slaves. Do you understand how exalted the Son of Man is? He is the Son of God. And had he done nothing to save us, he would be worthy of our most exultant and most impassioned praises. He would be worthy of hands lifted and knees bowed and voices raised in a shout. And yet, not only is he worthy in his nature, he comes to do precisely this to weep tears, to repair a breach, to endure an agony, to shed his blood, and to bring the blessing of salvation. John himself says, let me give you another example of how great he is. I baptize you with water. I I can cleanse you in a symbolic way. But let me tell you what this one's going to do. He's going to bring you into the very presence of God himself. God, the Holy Spirit, will come upon you. Consider what this means for an Israelite. The God of Sinai that they could not approach will now bring them into the very fire of God's presence. The God of Sinai that said, do not come up the mountain because you will die, is now going to bring them into his very presence through the person of his Messiah. The God who had said, stay away, is now saying, come near. The God who was saying, you may not, is now saying, you must come. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Listen, brothers and sisters, we can't know him too well. We can't know him too well. And if we would know God, we must know the Lord Jesus Christ. We are meant in this introduction to have our appetites whetted for the greatest event and purpose of our lives. The greatest purpose of your life is knowing God the Son come in the flesh to save us and bring us to his Father. Let me urge us, how well do we know him? How well do we know him, this true Son of God? How well do you know him? Mark is speaking to a Roman world surrounded by powerful people looking for fame, sensual people looking for pleasure, and idolatrous people looking for false hope. Is it really very different today? Powerful people looking for fame, sensual people looking for pleasure, idolatrous people looking for false hope, and Christians trying to endure the antagonism and persecutions of that world. Is it really any different today? And so God sends through Mark this letter to you. And he urges you this question. Do you know my son? The one that was prophesied for hundreds of years. His messenger would come, that a divine prophet trumpets his arrival, that the people are called to repentance because Yahweh himself comes over the wilderness to meet with his people, and you must come and humble yourselves and cast yourselves at his feet in submission and repentance and worship and receive the gift of the presence of God that he bestows. And so Mark would say, do you know what's happening right now? Do you know him? Is your heart prepared for him? Is your baptism by the Spirit of God evident in your life? Is your 
repentance and turning away from all other pleasures evident because of a clinging to and longing for this one that John said was more worthy than anything else and anyone else in this life. Let's consider families. Fathers, are we leading our children to know the Lord Jesus Christ? Let us not think there is something more important that they need to know. They need to know Jesus more than they need to know math, more than they need to know soccer, more than they need to know it's their bedtime. They need to know Jesus. They need to know Jesus more than the humorous, funny things of this world. They need to know him. Husbands, are you leading your wives to know the Lord Jesus Christ? Let us not assume that we have a higher calling than to lead them to Jesus. In the arms of faith, taking a wife to the Lord Jesus Christ There is nothing more important for a husband to do than that. And doing everything else but that is to fail. And doing that and missing many other things is to make sure the most important thing is happening. Doesn't require a great preaching voice, doesn't require clever insights. It just requires declaring to her the glory of the Son of God, the life changing glory of this one who has come to reveal God to us and to save us. Wives, are you pointing your husbands to the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you more desperate for your husband to know him than you are to have attention for yourself? Husbands, are are you more concerned for your wife to know the Lord Jesus than that she would have attention uh, to you? Where where is our priority? Is, Is there this determination? I want you to know him. Singles, here is your family. How are you doing at speaking the name of the Lord Jesus to those around you? Young people. Do your friends know that what you care about is the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you asked them questions about the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you speaking to them about him? He is more important than anything else you can be talking about. What about Sundays? When the church family gathers, here is the day of days. Here is the the gathering of God's people by faith in the new Jerusalem. And in that new Jerusalem, there is one throne and there is one song. This is the moment when we discipline our minds to cast every other consideration and anxiety and distraction aside to declare we want to know you. We want to know you. We want to love you. We want to be shaped for you. We want to worship you. We want to see you more clearly in your word. We want to see what we have not yet seen. We want to be shown what you must show us. We want to be shown the presence of God which only you provide in the gathering of your church. We want to see God the Son incarnate, crucified, and risen. We want to know you. And yes, that shapes how we think about everything leading up to the Sunday meeting. It shapes our Saturday night. It shapes our Sunday morning. It shapes what time we get here. It shapes our response in the singing. It shapes how we listen to messages and respond to messages and discuss God's word. It shapes us not because our church is anything special, but because we gather around the one who is. Brothers and sisters, we must come on Sundays to know Him. 
Here is the one who gives his people the very presence of God. We come to Mount Sinai, and yet this Mount Sinai is covered over with the presence of God. His people welcomed in, and they can encounter him through his spirit and the preaching of his word and the singing of his worship. Here we are as the gathered people of the Lord Jesus Christ to know him and to love him and to anticipate seeing him face to face. There is nothing more important than to know him. Him, and Sunday is the time in which we know him. Let us know him in the week and let us know him on Sundays. Let us come ready to know him, hungry to be fed of him, hungry to drink of that fountain, hungry to see of that light, hungry to hear our shepherd's voice calling his sheep. You and I well know that the week is full of opportunities to forget we are Christians. And Sunday is the time when we remember most clearly so that we can faithfully love the Lord Jesus all week long. How easy to forget that you are a Christian on Wednesday of this week when you're talking to your boss. How easy to forget you are a Christian even this night when you're browsing the internet. How easy to forget that you are a Christian when you are talking with your spouse or your child or your friend. How easy to forget that you are a Christian when you are thinking about that bill to be paid or that sound in your car. How easy to forget you are a Christian when your dear, beloved Christian friend dies and to grieve as one who has no hope. How easy during the week to forget you are a Christian. So during the week, and especially on Sunday, we need to know Christ so that we can be Christians. Brothers and sisters, we cannot know him too well. Is there anything more important this year than knowing Jesus Christ better? No. Nothing. Even if I may say this, your personal growth in character takes a second place beside and as a result of your knowing Christ better. All else flows from this. If we do not know this We are merely religious people trying to be better than our neighbors. Knowing this, all else comes to us as well. Ought not the sheep to be familiar with the shepherd? Ought not the patient Tell me honestly, are you not sick somewhere? Ought not the patient to be familiar with the physician? Ought not the bride to be familiar with the bridegroom? Ought not the sinner to be familiar with the Savior? Surely we cannot know this Christ too well. Here is the purpose of our lives. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Yahweh come in the flesh. God himself revealed to his people, bringing them into his very presence. Surely, surely, we cannot know him too well. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pause in reflection on your word. We pause and we ask you to forgive us for prioritizing many other things over you. Lord, forgive us for prioritizing 
the comings and goings of political leaders more than you. Wherever we have done that, Lord. Forgive us for hungering after the next episode more than you. Forgive us, Lord, for craving our comfort and respect from other people more than we respect you. Lord, forgive us for demanding our rights more than we long to know you. And Lord, thank you that since you have revealed yourself, we know that you do provide forgiveness. So we come, Lord, even as those people did, except we come directly to you and we confess our sins. We confess our sins and we receive your forgiveness. And now, Lord, we pray. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. And for more than any reason, Lord, fill us with your Spirit for the knowing of you. Holy Spirit, illuminate the Lord Jesus. Create a hunger that cannot be satisfied in us except as we feast on him. Show us your glory, Lord.